I'm going to use this uh, little mock-up to illustrate today's sermon, and you'll see how archaeology uh, just con not only confirm the Bible stories, but also help us uh, to make the Bible three-dimensional. It uh, helps us to get an idea how things were, the context in which the uh, events in the Word of God happened here, in this case, about the life of Jesus. But first, I would like to uh, acknowledge Dr. Rodrigo Silva. He's the one uh, that uh, wrote the sermon. And he did the sermon in Brazil, uh, and we appreciate it so much that I decided to share with you today. Uh, he is a theologian, archaeologist, and a philosopher. He uh, teaches in one of our schools in Brazil, uh, universities, and he was so gracious when I asked him if I could share this with you, and he said, please do, and he said, uh, no need to mention me, copyrights belongs to God. And that speaks volumes about who he is. There is one more person that I need to thank today, and that's my sister Eliana. I could never have finished that on time to do this and be able to share this with you. And I praise God for having my sister with me. Uh, we decided to do this so you can understand a little better the Holy Bible. Not only that, but that you not only fall in love with the story of Jesus' life, but with the Jesus of the story. So, uh, um, I'll come to this model a little later to explain a little bit about the parable that we're going to um, talk about today. By the way, yes, it's all about the cross, and thank you very much for sharing that beautiful song with us this morning. Yeah, it's a parable that some people have difficulty understanding, the parable of the prodigal son. And I confess myself, <laughs> growing up, I always wondered. Um, I'd like to invite you, if you brought your Bibles with you, I'd like to invite you to uh, open your Bibles in Luke chapter 15, verses, uh, starting in verse 11. I'll be reading for the New International Version. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The youngest one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the state. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to uh, his fields uh, to feed pigs. He longed for, uh, to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will send out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. 
When he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed a fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all those years I've been a slave for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened cow for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But he ha we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That is the parable. Uh, I have to agree with Dr. Rodrigo. When I first read this parable, I confess I had some doubts, more doubts than certainties. Uh, let's think a little bit about this uh, test. It was a long test, but it was worth it. For starters, it's a very unfair parable. Yes, very, very unfair. Let's try to modernize a little bit this parable so we can understand better its meaning. A father had how many sons? Two sons. Okay, one was a very good son. He was a hard worker. He never disobeyed his father. He never made his, uh, gave a headache to his father. He worked hard in the family business. The second son, on the other hand, he was <laughs> not worth it, the plate he ate on. He, he was not responsible. How we say he was a bon vivant, right? The father sometimes had to wake up in the middle of the night because the police was calling, saying, hey, your son was uh, drunk driving and uh, had a car accident. He totaled the car or, it's, or had to go down to the police station to get uh, his son out of there because of delinquency. Or maybe that son had uh, been to many clinics uh, for treatment of narcotics that he was taking and never healed. He lived from allowances. He did not work. He was really, you're getting the picture of the younger son? Good. So maybe he stole things uh, from the fa father's house to pay for some of his addictions. Well, one day this son comes to the father and says, Dad, give me my heritage. The father goes, sell his whole company, everything he had, converts into cash, and give him the money, his half that he deserves, well, that he claims. Years later, he goes out and spends all the money. Years later, he comes shameless back home, okay, while the other brother is still working for the family business. And he asks, uh, you know, uh, and the father accepts him back. Well, one day the older father, uh, the older brother comes home and he hears all that music and dancing and uh, a big party going on in the house. He asks, oh, why is the party? Eh? The party is because your father is happy. He's celebrating that your son came back. And more, the Bible says that the father ordered to uh, bring a robe and a ring and sandals. 
In biblical times, that means that uh, you are elevating that person to a position of, uh, of management, a top management position. Remember Joseph's story that uh, he also got special, a special robe from his father? So in our contemporary story, imagine that the father gave this young son to manager a big position in the company. Reason with me now. Isn't this upsetting? Imagine if you were the older brother and now you have to work with that uh, brother of yours that did all those things. Be honest, would you be happy? And that's why when I was growing up, I had a problem with, I would be like the older brother saying, how come? You work, you work hard, you never disobey the father, never give him motive to worry. The other one has a care, careless life, spend all the family money, then comes back and you have to put up with him working with you. Is this a correct image of a father? Hey. I know that some psychologists, uh, psychologists will say that this father, he is, um, doesn't know how to set up limits. He's a very weak father, that he will do anything that the son wants. His son can get away with anything. The son then comes back as a hero. The worst part is that in this parable, do you know who the father represents? Yes, God. So my question to you is, is God, would God be a father like this, a complex lax? Okay, the other problem that we have with this parable, it seems that the parable has no end. You see, you notice the father is at the door, uh, arguing, convincing the son, come on, let's celebrate, right? It's an obvious question that anyone can ask. So, did he accept? Did he go up? Did he come to the party to celebrate or not? Have you ever asked this question? It's kind of, what happened? It's like when you're watching a movie and it finishes and you're left there like, and? It seems that the story has no end. Why did Jesus finish this parable without an epilogue or a conclusion? Interesting. And to finish, another problem that we have with this parable is the title of the Bible's translations give it, that give it to, to this parable, parable of the prodigal son. Like he's the center uh, character, the hero of the story. He's not. He's not an exemplary student that a teacher would have pleasure teaching. He's not a fantastic brother or sister that I love, we would love to have at home. He's not a son that uh, you would really be proud, this is my son. But the parable of the prodigal son, it sounds like he gets the reward, doesn't it? Well, let's understand this text a little bit. So pay attention. He's in, um, before that, I have one more problem that uh, was raised by some uh, atheist theologians. It seems that the parable wasn't spoken by Jesus. I will explain. For us to understand the word of God, I'll have to give you a tip from hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a big word to say is the science of interpretation. Uh, the tip as follows. I always try to look into the context of the passage. And you've probably heard that before. So if you still have your Bibles opened, pay attention. Here in chapter 15, verse 11, it says, Jesus continued. Well, if you continue, it's because there was something before. Do you agree? You can continue if you haven't started something, right? So, um, it says that Jesus continued because there was something before. 
And what was part of the contest? What is immediately before that? Well, the parable of the last coin. You can find that in verse 8. And I'm just going to tell you quickly so it doesn't prolong too long. Uh, this parable is very simple. It's like a child parable. Uh, a woman had 10 coins. She lost one coin. She swept all her house. She found a coin, and she celebrated with her friends. Okay? So it's a, very, a little dull. It's not very exciting. Right? But that parable it starts with an alternative conjunction, or, in verse 8. So if that starts with or, it's because there is another situation, because either this or that, right? Making sense? Okay. And what is before the parable of the lost coin? Well, then we have the parable of the lost sheep. And the parable of the lost sheep starts in verse 3 with the following word. Then, so, if I start with then, it's because there is something before. And that is immediately before, what is immediately before that? Let's go back and look at it. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering up around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eat with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. See, the critics of the Bible, um, those skeptic theologians, they say the following, look uh, Luke's first historical error is that Pharisees and scribes did not stay in the same room as Pharisees and sinners. You see, uh, one of the things for the Jews that is very, very, very important in their real religiosity, <laughs> tongue twister for me, is that uh, they do, don't want to get contaminated themselves. And by eating in the same place as uh, those sinners, they would get contaminated. So what Luke is saying, uh, the, the, this uh, atheist people are saying here, is that uh, Jesus could not be talking with the Pharisees and the scribes at the same place that the Pharisees and the tax collector were because they didn't want to get contaminated. You understand why they are saying that Luke is saying wrong? Because they would never, if uh, there is a sinner and a tax collector here, I am not going to go there. That's how Jewish people did, right? Or oh, the, the Pharisees and the scribes. So um, now you understand why they say that Luke was uh, uh, in error. But we are going to now come to our model so we can understand this uh, this part. In a typical house of uh, biblical times, this is a typical house of the Iron Period, about 1200 before Christ. But at the time of Jesus, the architectural model of the houses did not change much, okay? It wasn't that much different. So um, you can see here that they have one entrance, okay? Uh, there was a big wall here, a big wall here, big wall here, and a big wall here. The only entrance to the house was there, one entrance to the house, okay? I'll move this a little bit because I'm going to have to turn it for you to see. Okay, so uh, over here you have a little room. And this is a guest room. Remember uh, when Joseph, Mary, Jesus, they didn't have a place to stay and uh, in the inn? This is a guest room. This is the hostel. This is the inn on that time. You don't think that the inn that is in the Bible is a hotel. This is not what he meant. The inn was a guest room, okay? And then there was the, the uh, upper level, the terrace. 
okay? And that's where the social life of the families would happen, on right here on the top, okay? Now, I did not put a wall on this side, so you can look inside with me, okay? So let me turn this now. And maybe uh, the uh, camera can uh, put that on the screen so everybody can see a little better because I know people are very far. And uh, zoom in on that. Thank you very much. So, when you enter to the house, to the door here, okay, the first place where you would go was the patio. Okay? If you look uh, in the back, you have some pillars here, and then you have a fence right in the back there. I don't know, can the camera get that? So, right in the back there, we see a fence, and we see the cow, the ox, and those animals, they were fenced back in there. Okay, then the other side of the fence, running free, you have the lamb and the goats and the, those kinds, types of animals. Okay, so you have the lamb. Now you want to get something about uh, BB uh, culture that, of that time. Do you remember a story of Jefty? I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. But, huh? Jephthah. Jephthah. Mm, thank you. Jephthah. Remember he said that the first being that uh, would uh, meet him, he would offer as a sacrifice to the Lord? You know, because the animals were free in here. So he thought as soon as he opened the door, either a lamb or goat or, uh, will come to meet him. And, uh, but in his case, it was his daughter that came to meet him. Okay, so you understand how come he was expecting to get in a house and have an animal come to him. Because the animals were free in the patio. Okay? So, next, um, here you have an oven, right here. And then the stove, this, yeah. Okay, where they would cook in, uh, in the open. Uh, on this side, you have the room where would they keep uh, as food storage, and they would keep tools, and during the winter, they would keep the animals there too, okay? Up here, in the second floor, is where it was the only family room of the house, okay? They didn't, they didn't have a, a living room, dining room, the, no. There was one family room, and that was it, right in here. Here you have then the guest room, remember? You saw it from the front, okay? And then we have the terrace. Well, the terrace was where the social life uh, happened. You can see here a little lady sitting and a little child there. Uh, that's where their social life ha happened. You know, it was very hot and still is in the Middle East. And it was very common for people to um, sleep on the rooftops of the houses. Um, can you see the people here now? In Deuteronomy, it, it says that everybody that would build a house have to build some eavesdrops because uh, otherwise the person could fall from the, f the, the house top, right? And because of that, uh, they would be guilty of blood if they build a house without a protection for the people, okay? Uh, also, uh, that is why Jesus said in Matthew 24, talking about his return, uh, he said, Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are in his house. Don't come down, because people stayed in the roof. Okay? So the roof was very, a very, very common social place. The majority of the meals were done at the roof. Did you know that? Yeah. Look here. This part uh, is the parlor of the house. Uh, is the upper room. Does it ring a bell? There was a covering, 
And they prepared a table here where I have this little mat, okay? And they would sit in here and eat in here, in the outside, in the open air. Jesus, when he did the communion service, it was in a place similar to this one. Now that you know all this, let's go back to the parables context, okay? How could the Pharisees and the scribes see that Jesus was eating with the publicans and the sinners? Now you get the answer. The model will give you the answer. Now, look, if someone eating in here and somebody is going down here, do you think that they could see whoever was in there? Could you see the people on the roof? So could the Pharisees and scribes see that Jesus was eating with the sinners and the uh, tax collectors and the publicans? You have your answer. So Luke wasn't wrong. Okay? Um, if so, if anyone ate, whoever passed on the street, looking up, could see the people eating. Now, look what happened. The Pharisees and scribes uh, from the street, on the host top, were eating with sinners and the publicans. So they complained to maybe some of the disciples that were outside, down there, or even with the owner of the house, we don't know. So your master, who claims to be a prophet, receives sinners and eat with them? What do you think? Do you think that Jesus uh, screamed from the top here, saying, hey, what are you complaining about? What's the problem down there? Do you think that Jesus did that? No. Uh, if you look in your Bible and you pay attention, you'll see the scribes and Pharisees are in front of the house, looking up, seeing Jesus receiving publicans and sinners. Maybe you... He was the house of uh, Levi Matthew. We don't know when this happens, one of the publicans. Jesus, very important, did not associate with sinners to pet them and say, oh, poor you. No, he did that to rescue them, to save them. Okay? So for this is very important because <laughs> you, you cannot use this as an excuse to go to parties and uh, things like that, saying, well, Jesus associated with sinners. I have to associate with sinners too. Jesus had a purpose. He, it's not like that. Now, the Pharisees were not laughing. On the contrary, they were very upset. This man, man receives sinners and eats with them. You know what Jesus did? Jesus came down, came down the stairs, dun, 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 went through the door, and met the Pharisees and the scribes, and started talking with them. Say, why are you upset? Oh, because you are eating with sinners and in the upper room. Then Jesus did something very interesting. He broke the ice. You know, there are three good ways to break the ice. First one, you smile. A sincere smile, not a, a sincere smile. Another way you can break, break, his, break the ice, you can tell a good joke. And normally, uh, that relaxes the tension. And the third way, you can tell a story. Now, a story is a, a, um, a way of catching somebody's attention. And it's so effective that it's being used in companies today, and it's called storytelling. Well, are you upset? Let me tell you three stories. So here's the first story. There was a man that had 100 sheep. He lost one of them, left the 99 in the desert, and went looking for the lost sheep. So no sheep could arrive at the fold before the others. Maybe he asked a friend to take care of the other 99 while he was looking for the lost one. And that's a part that I never paid attention before, because he didn't go home with all the 100. 
lock them up, and then went looking for the one. I don't know if you had that image before. Well, Jesus told another story of the woman who lost the coin. This image that you're seeing now is uh, from Bedouin women dressed with wedding costumes. Did you notice that they have lots of coins hanging in their face? This is because in remote times, the women who got married, uh, her father would give her uh, an in a life insurance, a uh, dowry, okay? And that she could use as a collar, as pensions, some other way. Uh, if something happened to her husband, that the husband died, or he went to war, or there was an emergency, what would happen? She would use the coins, her life insurance, to be able to go back home. You see? So that was very, very important to her. Now, if uh, she lost those coins, she lost her life insurance. She lost everything. And now you start to understand why that woman was so diligent <laughs> swiping all the house until she found the coin, okay? Now, even today, when there is a wedding uh, in the tribe, all the other women use their veils, okay, with the coins. Look at this photo. That was their dowry. She would, uh, you would do the same. Swipe the floor until you find it. By the way, the Bible tells something very interesting in that parable. That uh, she lit up a lamp and then swiped the floor because it was very dark. If you see here, even here today it's very dark and we have a lot of light. The houses on that time, they do, did not have windows. Very important. So imagine that this is covered. You just have the door open here. There is no windows. So she lit up a lamp. How the Bible is precise. It's amazing. She lit up a lamp and then swiped the floor. There was a lot of dust and all that until she find the, count, the coin. Now think with me. The sheep was lost where? outside the house, right? Do you think that the sheep knew she was lost? Well, yes, animals know when they're lost. If you ever had a dog and you get lost, it tries desperate to get back home. You even see movies about the little dog trying to make it back home. Animals have a conscience that they are lost, okay? So in the power of the lost sheep, the reality is that some people are outside the house and they know that he or she is lost. Now, in the parable of the coin, the coin has no conscience and doesn't know it's lost. So that's the reality of someone that is lost inside the house and have no idea that he or she is lost. The coin, coin was lost inside the house the sheep was lost outside in the desert. There are two realities. Outside and knows that he's lost, inside and has no idea it's lost, right? Well, to end with a checkmat, he tells the story, the parable of the prodigal son. The father, the loving father has two lost sons. And how do I know that? They are both lost. Uh, Dr. Rodrigo read a book from uh, Mr. Kenneth Bailey. Uh, the title of the book is Poet and Pleasant. Peasant. This uh, man worked many, many years uh, with the Bedouins uh, in the desert. He told the parables of Jesus to those uh, Bedouins in Lebanon, you know? And one day, uh, Dr. Rodrigo was 
in the des desert of Sahara in Sudan, and he was with the Bedouins, and he told the stories for them too. And when he told the story of the parable of uh, the prodigal son, their, their response was the same as the Bedouins in Lebanon. They said, lie, lie, lie. Yes. This would never happen. It says, why not? It says, because for a young lad to ask his father his inheritance it means that he wants the father to die. He hates his father. And that would never happen. They would never do that. You see, in the patriarchal system, and th those Bedouins, they have been living in those circumstances uh, f until today. So they keep a lot of the traditions. And so it's very important for us to what they say. Um, they hated the father. But the Bible says that the father divided the inheritance between the two sons. So the older son also received his part. The difference is that the younger son, even being wrong, was honest with his sentiments. The older son was being a hypocrite. But you know, God is less offended by the honest of a sinner than by the hypocrisy of a just. Sometimes we are at church, but in a completely artificial manner, just like a facade. At the end of the parable, when the son returns, the father rescues him. The father throws a party for him. And I imagine that in that parable of the prodigal son, the father had a house similar to this one in a farm. And here on the upper room, the father throws a party to his son. When the older son arrives from the field and he arrives at the door and heard the dancing festivities in the upper place, he asked the servant what's happening, right? And they said, oh, your father received your brother. The older brother refused to get in and stayed at the door. This is a big offense. According to the book of Esther, Queen Vasti lost the throne because she refused to uh, go to a party that King Asuero was inviting her to go. To refuse to come to a party by your father, that your father is throwing, is a very serious offense. The Bedouins told Dr. Rodrigo that. And they live there, it's their culture. So the other brother is angry, stayed at the door and refused to enter. What did the father do? The father left the young son at the terrace and went downstairs and went to talk with him. He said, my son, come in. Please come in. We have to celebrate because your brother was lost and has been found, was dead and has begun to leave. And why does the parable stop here? Is the our last question? Because if you pay attention uh, to what is said, the parable scene and with the same scene where Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees were. A spiritual reception happening and up here, and the Pharisees and scribes murmuring at the door. A reception party to the young son happening in the upper room, and the older son murmuring at the door. Jesus, because he loved the scribes and Pharisees, came down and tried to talk to their hearts, showing them that they also were lost. To show to the uh, older son that he was the lo as lost as the young brother. And that's for us. Without Jesus, without the cross, we're all lost. But the older son was, see the difference was, the young son was the lost sheep, and the older brother was the lost coin. Do you understand how the model now illustrates and helps us to understand better the Bible story? Now is the time for us to have a, a little heart-to-heart -heart talk. How is your spiritual life with God? Are you a person who is lost and knows that you're lost and doesn't know how to find your way back? Or are you a coin that is lost inside the house, in the church, and don't know you're lost? Are you as a rebel as the young son, or as a hypocrite as the older brother? I'm not judging you. And it could be that one day you're a coin and the other day you're a sheep. 
One day you're the young son, and the other day you're the old brother. It doesn't matter. What matters, what's most important, is that if you're lost in the desert or inside the house, there is a God looking for you. And he it was symbolized by the woman looking for the coin, by the shepherd looking for the sheep, and by the father that came running to his son. Okay? Now, he finished his sermon making a challenge. There is one more picture I want to show it to you. This is a scene of the prodigal son while he was taking care of the pigs. He was in the middle of the pigs, in the, in the mud. He could smell this stinky uh, smell around him, and he felt the need to return to the father's house. Now, imagine if he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a little picture saying, home sweet home. I will wash the pigs and put some perfume. I will uh, paint around me. It will, I will make a home out of this place. Now, do you think that would work? No. Pretty soon the pigs will get dirty, the stink smell would come back, and it wouldn't be a home sweet home. You see, we, we cannot transform the pig pen in a home. Because a pig pen can never be a home. Um, do you really want to get out of the mud? First, recognize your need, that you need salvation. Let go of that silly pride of yours. Second, remember that you have a loving God that's looking for you. And third, stop trying to embellish the world. This is not your home. You have us to surrender to God. Surrender, renounce the world, and renounce sin. You will never transform the pig pen into a home. The solution is to return to the Father's house. So, if you are away from God, and if you, don't, if you don't know how to come, because you don't want to come back to the church, because you're upset, you don't... There's too many hypocrites inside the church, or you think religious, religion does not save you, or you prefer to stay home. It's a relaxed Christianity. Well, in the name of Jesus, your holidays are over. Come and meet real people, but don't go to church because the pastor did this, the elder did that, or uh, I don't like the older brothers, or don't do that. Don't do like the older brother or the scribes and Pharisees complaining at the door because inside the church we're celebrating a, a lost sinner that came to Jesus. Just come in. There's space for one more. Your holidays are over and I want to be direct with you. Jesus had to leave the party and get you at the door. You have to make the decision if you will come in or not. That's why the parable does not have an end. Understand now? Because it concludes with an identical episode when Jesus was with the scribes and the Pharisees at the door of the house. They had to decide. The second group of people, you go away from the father's house like the prodigal son, and think you have gone too far. I have one thing to say. Let God be God. He will reach out to you too. Amen. <laughs>